Joining me on the phone is author Greg Renoff. Greg, can you hear me okay? Did I press all the buttons? Uh, you, you got her done. I'm here. Okay. I know uh, it's hard not to cuss on a day like this, but we are live on the air. I'm just going to throw that out there. <laughs> uh, absolutely miserable day, isn't it, for rock fans and for music fans? You know, it's uh, it's kind of hard to accept it. I think we all knew that Eddie Van Halen had some health issues over the last few years. I think that was always kind of a in the back of a lot of our minds that we'd all had hopes that he was going to uh, recover fully and it just never seemed to happen. I know that uh, I speak for a lot of Van Halen fans who just sort of, it's an end of an era. I mean, it just really, uh, it was just a part of my life, the Van Halen fandom and being a person who loved their music and they changed my life in such a profound way. Um, ever since I first heard them back in 1984, it's just a, uh, it's a hard thing to accept. And uh, I am, uh, in one sense, you know, filled with a lot of gratitude for everything he gave, because I think we all can accept and, understand that Eddie Van Halen gave us all to, uh, his craft one way or the other, and uh, he uh, made himself uh, an icon through hard work and through a commitment to their music. I and mean, the brothers and Alex and Ed um, were doing it since they were little kids, and uh, to have it end like this, it's just, you know, there's no good way to end, but it's just hard to accept 65 years old and Eddie Van Halen is gone. When you were doing research for your book, Van Halen Rising, which is, by the way, any Van Halen fan, any music fan should definitely read that book. I know you talked to a lot of the people who saw Van Halen start in the backyard parties in Pasadena. Uh, how are they taking the news today? You know, I got some texts from a couple of people, uh, two or three people, and some messages from folks. It's, you know, I think for them, it, it's, uh, you know, I said a part of my youth is gone, but for for them, they they um, you know, they grew up with that and now a lot of these uh, folks that were classmates in high school and you know would go by their lockers at school and say hey i'm going to be at the party tonight you know and talk to the brothers and talk to dave roth and so it's i think for them it's a really profoundly different kind of loss it's um pasadena was the hometown of van halen pasadena california and it was a uh you know evident from the research i did for the book van halen rising and anytime you talk to anybody it was everybody had a van halen story you know even if yeah. it was like after they were famous like you know because they were local legends, you know, you'd be like, oh, I saw Eddie Van Halen at the 7-Eleven, you know, <laughs> you yeah. know, whatever. It was just <laughs> from that, as the the kids who were younger, you know, basically, basically, um, you know, kids more my age, they grew up in Pasadena and speak to the folks who were, went to high school with them and went to the backyard parties or through the backyard parties or saw them in nightclubs. It's, um, it's very uh, painful for them. I've gotten some, you know, so people tell me they're crying and just it's a deep loss because it uh, was something that they, uh, saw from ground zero all the way up to superstardom and you also have a, a newer book out uh, platinum producer about producer ted templeman who worked with obviously van halen uh, in the early well for the david Lee roth era especially sure and, and have you heard from ted i haven't I, I left him a message um i spoke to someone who spoke to him and just said he's just super you know he's devastated yeah. I, I i talked to him over the last few months and you know he um was definitely somebody who was very, very close to Ed in a lot of ways, even if they didn't talk, he felt a very close, a close bond to him, you know, over the years, whatever time passes, but, you know, Christmas or whatever, you catch up about kids or family or whatever. And he really, um, I know he's taking it hard because I know in the last few months when I've talked to Ted about it, he was very just concerned and it's gotta be hard to see somebody you grew up with, uh, meaning that he saw Ed as, as a, basically as a baby musician, 19 year old, kid all the way up to superstardom it's got to be very hard for ted i haven't talked to him but i'm fact i will soon and eddie van halen he was the reason why ted wanted van halen wanted to sign van halen it was all because of eddie wasn't it absolutely i mean i think the thing about about eddie van halen is that from ted Templeman's perspective he was the guy who kind of wowed him that night you know they always told me the band was good the the songs were good but the guy that really did it was the was the guitar player so what about for you? I mean, we're all Van Halen fans, you know. And there's there's a certain there's a Van Halen Twitter out there for uh, all of us. Uh, but for someone like you, you've put a lot of time and research into uh, your books. Um, what about how do you how are you holding up? I should say. I just it's you know I, I said it today and you know I never met Eddie Van Halen. I never spoke to him on the phone. I did an interview him from the book, and so it was always for me it was being a hundred yards away from him in an arena and seeing him play. Mm -hmm. That was always something that was special for me. But, you know, I had a very, very profound 
impact on my life made me want to play guitar. And then as a historian made me want to tell the story about, about the band. Um, because I, I knew that they had changed the lives of so many people. And that's been the, the, the gratifying thing for today. I've had a number of messages from people saying, you know, the, thank you for the book. And you really made Van Halen music even more special for me. Cause I kind of, understood how hard they worked and that was the goal for writing Van Halen Rising and in a lot of ways was to kind of show the level of commitment once I really started to research it and saw how many years those guys played for you know for no money in the middle of nowhere and little dive bars in LA playing for bikers you really started to realize the commitment that was there it wasn't about quick fame or you know for any other reason they just loved the music the brothers and Dave and Michael Anthony so so for me um to know that I put those words on paper and kind of told their story, it means it's meaningful, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's sort of surreal, you know, definitely is one of those things that hasn't sunk in. And I'm just sad for his, um, his immediate family, his brother, and of course his, his son and all the people who loved him. It was close family. You know, it's gotta be a very hard day because, uh, you know, cancer is a terrible, yeah. terrible thing. You know, I was, uh, it's funny you mentioned that being in the same building 100 yards away from Eddie Van Halen. I was talking about this earlier uh, on the air that you know my first Van Halen concert was 1984. And for me, it was such a surreal moment just being in the same room, even though that room was a, an arena. Being in the same room with that band, Eddie Van Halen, Daley Roth, Michael Anthony, Alex Van Halen, a band that I absolutely fell in love with when I was 10 years old in 1980. And it was such a surreal moment that has lasted forever. You know what I mean? Every time I hear a Van Halen song or I, I put on an album, it's I'm that 16 year or I'm that, I'm that 14 year old kid again at a concert. And, you know, that's the thing too about the music. It's really, it's a constant. That's the thing that people who are music fans understand. It's something that's there. You know, you, you've changed, but the the songs are there, you know, and it's, it's yeah, like 14 year old. The first time you hear a Van Halen song, or 12 years old, whatever it is, you're still listening to Van Halen when you're 50, 55 years old, or you know, it's just it's there. And I think that's for for a lot of people, it was just a constant throughout their life. And uh, you know, it's just like any sort of fandom; it goes beyond for some people just sort of a casual thing. It's a passion, and that's and you know, the people that I talk to on Twitter, and you know, tons of obviously millions of Van Halen fans have that deep that deep passion for the band. It's just that's why they're legends. And so it's to have it now be in the, you know, knowing, I mean, even maybe even the hardest thing beyond saying that Eddie Van Halen has gone from the earth, knowing there's no more Van Halen concerts. It can't, I mean, I don't think, I think we all can agree, you know, far be it for me to say this, but I, I have trouble imagining right. there being a Van Halen without Eddie Van Halen. That wouldn't be up to me or, you know, but yeah. that's just from my perspective, it's just it's unthinkable. And so to have that be, there'll never be another show. It's just hard to, hard to even think that, that being that, you know? Is his story the quintessential American dream story? I mean, you know best. You've written the you books. Know, I, I think that's the other thing, too, that people who want to now dive into the life of Eddie Van Halen, I mean, you just can go on, read his story in Wikipedia. I mean, it's just, it is the American, the very the summary. It's just the American dream story. Two brothers come from Europe to America with a family that's very working class. Parents don't speak the language. They don't speak the language. They don't really fit in. But those guys, that they're themselves on a, on a course to uh, pursue what they dreamed about, which was, was, which was, you know, making music. And I think the thing that's interesting about the Van Halen brothers particularly is that, you know, I don't think they, they had, especially before they met David Lee Roth, which is a whole different story, some sort of aspirations to be like superstars to play in sports <laughs> stadiums. That wasn't their aspiration. I think they just were doing it because that's what they did. You know, sometimes people grow up in a football family and that's what you do. You play high school football and you, play peewee football and you go on and some of you play college football it's the family trade basically you know that's that was their trade and i think you know um to go from the immigrant travels to america in 1952 to you're playing stadiums and you're dominating mtv two decades later that's the american dream <laughs> that's like you know unthinkable for for anyone but anyone everyone can identify with it in some ways you know it's like it's not going to happen to there's only one Eddie Van Halen, but we all can kind of identify that as Americans. So that's that's what America is about. That you can come to America and you know make your way and become the success that everyone dreams about having. Is there a Van Halen album you're going to be listening more to tonight than others? Maybe. Oh, you know, probably I'll, I'll probably if I'm going to listen to one today, I'll probably put on Van Halen one. You know, for me that's the the shot out of the gate yeah. that 
that changed the world of rock music. And there's, you know, it could go through the entire catalog and each album has its own special um, things you can say about it. But that's the one that shocked the world. And uh, if anything else came out of Inhale and Rising, hopefully people understood where they came from um, musically and how it seemed like such a left turn to so many people um, in terms of the hard rock sound in that moment in time and for them to go and become so successful in an era that really didn't seem, meaning 1978, where they were really well suited to what was on the radio and stuff. It's really another remarkable thing about the Van Halen story. It's just, you know, somebody said to me, um, um, someone who worked with them said to me, and just generically about musicians in general, but he said, you know what? Talent always wins out in the end. Yeah. You know, and he's basically, I think this person was trying to say like, you know what? You may not be Eddie Van Halen, but if you're talented and you work at it, you might become a great session musician or you'll play in Nashville or whatever. He's basically saying you can't, you know, if you're willing to work and you have the talent, it's not deniable. It's not going to get buried away. And it's just, you know, that's what he was, his point was about Van Halen. It may not have been um, the blueprint for what people thought was going to be successful in 1970 for rock music, but the talent was undeniable. You couldn't not look at that band and go, the whole band's incredible. And the guitar player was, on, you know, was the greatest. So. I'm seeing a, a, a common theme among all the other musicians that are uh, taking to social media today. It's innovator. You hear, you see that word in every single post. Yeah, and I think you know it goes beyond just the solos and it goes beyond just the riffs and the songs. I mean, there was, there was the innovation there, but to me, the innovation came with the technical aspects of just the mechanics of building guitars, the mechanics of painting guitars, the way that amps are constructed. I mean, Eddie was a guy who did more than just write the great riff. He did more than just write the cool solo. He could, you know, he could tear the guitar apart, put it back together again and, you know, make it sound different. And that was the thing that was special about him. There was only a few guys, Hendrix, Jimmy Page, um, you know, just a few guys who were those types of technical innovators and the musical innovators that kind of go along with it. Um, at least in the rock realm, you know, not too many guys. And so, yeah, there's, you know, there's not going to be another one like them, that's for sure. And it's uh, it's a really, really hard thing to kind of wrap your head around. But that's he has passed from the earth, and we all have to just remember him as the greatest. You don't often hear underrated and Eddie Van Halen in the same sentence, but he's also maybe the most underrated rhythm guitar player ever. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the thing. If you listen, you know, for for guitar players, you know, people who are so serious about it. You know, that's the things that they talk about. It's a little, you know, they talk about with drummers, the thing they call like ghost notes, like the little passing things that drummers do with their hands that are kind of the average person won't pick up, but yeah. drummers hear and go, oh, that was like, oh, there's a little rhythmic thing here. Do you hear that? And if you're not a drummer, you may not hear it, but the drummer's saying there's something else there. And that's the stuff that, you know, the way Eddie handled the pick, the way he did his pick slides, the way he did harmonics while he worked through his, rhythm parts, just all that little that little stuff that everyone tried to imitate, but no one could imitate. And that's the other thing, too, is, you know, there's, you know, there's plenty of guys you can play like them, obviously, but, you know, there's just, there's only one person who made it what it is, and that's Eddie Van Halen. Well, Greg, I appreciate you taking the time. I know uh, you're busy, especially today with, uh, with the sad news that Eddie Van Halen passed away at the age of 65. So, um if anyone out there wants to read a great book on Van Halen, Van Halen Rising is highly recommended. I I love it. I've read it a couple of times, as a matter of fact. And they can get it pretty much anywhere, right, Greg? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much on this very sad day, man. Hey, appreciate the opportunity to speak about it. Thank you so much. Thanks, Greg. It's Center Swing right now in the zoo.